All right, thank you so much. One of the things you should know about uh, Pastor Matthew, though, is um, if, he, if he pulled back his pastor shirt, you'd see engineer and scientist underneath because um, it's one of his passions. And, I, I, I'm, and so we're so grateful for you to actually um, you know, think of this, uh, Matthew, and get this going for us and to be able to make these connections. And so um, I'm just privileged tonight to be joined by my esteemed colleagues. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Mike Ressler, uh, Dr. Mark Underwood, and Dr. Lauren White, um, and, and each one has a, a unique story. Um, you would probably not ever see us together uh, in any way at JPL or here uh, tonight. We're crossing all those boundaries, and, and we've been brought together because we share a, a, a linkage, uh, and, and that linkage is, is being at JPL and, and being here at, at Lake Avenue, and so it's, it's just a pr privilege for us to actually be here and talk a bit about our passions and, and where God has placed us and um, how he's used us, really, to, I think, um, uh, both professionally and is using us here at Lake Avenue Church. So uh, without further ado, we're going to talk about what JPL does. And, and um, I'm, I'm sure, as Matthew said, you, 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 see, you see our pictures, you hear about what we do. Um, this is going to be a little more unpacking to, to really uh, talk about um, uh, the, the amazing things that JPL does and why we see Pasadena as just really an epicenter for this kind of, 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 um, of expertise and um, really leadership of the world that watches us to see what, what uh, we do with exploring space. So this will talk about uh, a little bit about a JPL. So if you didn't know, a JPL really is part of Caltech. Uh, we're really a division of Caltech. Uh, we were uh, founded in, in the 30s by Theodor von Karman. And we'll talk a little bit about that story. Uh, but um, Caltech is about a $2 billion uh, uh, agency. We are unique at NASA. So even though we're a division of Caltech, we're also a federally funded research and development center. Um, we're the only one that NASA has, which means that our, our job is really to push the envelope and to uh, do one-of-a-kind types of, of capability for the agency. Uh, they look to us for um, explore, uh, expertise and really being able to innovate what we do, and, uh, and that's, that's our, really our goal as a federal lab. So um, JPL, if you didn't know, is up there in the Arroyo. It's about uh, six miles uh, northwest of here. Uh, and uh, there's a story of how we got there, really, that, that is, has emerged uh, when it was first on campus. So these are the, some of the original Rocket Boys. Um, so the story goes that uh, they were on uh, the campus, they were at Caltech. Um, a few mishaps occurred. Uh, those mishaps uh, eventually led to them being booted out of the campus, and they said, go find a remote place. Uh, so they found their Royal Seiko, because nobody lived up there, right? Uh, and uh, they, they, they began to do rocket testing uh, there in the Royal Seiko back in the 30s. One of the folks you see is actually um, uh, Frank Molina. He became uh, one of the future directors of JPL. Um, and, uh, and, and really in the 40s, we were an Army research type, type uh, facility and lab looking at rocket testing and, and building a rocketry. Uh, what, what that led to is um, the first satellite, the U.S. was Explorer 1, built here uh, in the space race um, by JPL. Uh, and what our um, director realized at, at the, the time, uh, William Pickering, was the fact that um, the, the, we were going to shift from building rockets to building the payloads. And, and we were going to begin to build the instruments and the spacecraft. And uh, he was really instrumental in helping us go from uh, building rocketry to really becoming uh, what JPL did, which was to explore the planets and position us to do that. Uh, so our, our prime mission is really a robotic exploration of the, this, the universe, the solar system. Uh, so we, we certainly do the planetary tours and in, in, in exploration in science, which you've seen. Uh, but we also do astrophysics, and, and, and Mike is a good example of that. He's going to talk about some of his work in um, astrophysics as, as one of our, our leading uh, project scientists. Uh, we do Earth science, so we do monitoring of, of, of uh, you know, Earth's climate. Uh, we take measurements, observations. We use those for really helping to understand uh, what is happening in, um, in terms of, of our, our uh, home planet. 
Um, and, and we do uh, telecommunications, and one of the things I'll talk about is um, that, that uh, we've built the largest telecommunications network in the universe um, because we are talking to spacecraft um, using uh, telecommunications from, from Earth to that. And, and if, you didn't, if you think about that, that is an amazing phenomenon, the fact that we can actually be able to talk to a spacecraft that is um, billions of miles away uh, and send a signal that, uh, for 21 hours uh, to be able to get to that spacecraft. That's the ingenuity that we have here in, in Pasadena. So, uh, ingenuity, um, the helicopter's there, and we missed, we missed it, that the blade spinning test is not showing yeah, that, on that picture. That, yeah, we're going to show an example. If you see, a, thanks, Mark. You see a, the upper um, image there. It's, it's the Ingenuity helicopter that actually um, tagged along on our Perseverance landing with the Mars rover recently, and uh, we've got a, a wonderful slide, and, and uh, Lauren's going to introduce that. Um, so, uh, JPL has flown a number of missions, uh, really from the, the, the 60s forward, uh, and this just shows you uh, the, the instruments and missions that we're currently flying today, um, and just gives you an idea. So, so uh, we've got missions, again, flying in, in um, exploring our planets. We've got rovers on Mars, as you well know. We've got um, various astrophysics missions and Earth science missions that are all um, right now returning data to JPL, and we're operating as part of uh, our um, ongoing support for the exploration that we do. Um, so we've got a number of upcoming missions, uh, and some of those are really exciting. Uh, one of those, um, I'm going to hand off to Mike Ressler because uh, he is the project scientist, or one of them, for uh, the JWST. Yeah, so I'm, I'm project scientist for one of four instruments that's going to fly on the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it's a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, and it is going to launch on December 18th. <laughs> I, I say that with some trepidation because uh, I started working on a concept study for that instrument in 1997. So I've been working on this for 24 years. I am so ready to see this <laughs> thing launch. Um, but it is a successor to Hubble. Hubble allowed us to um, address a lot of questions, and it raised even more questions, and so uh, James Webb is the, the next large telescope that will allow us to answer those next set of questions. Yeah, and, and Mike's story is, is not unusual. There are people that ha spend careers on a mission because it takes so long sometimes to actually get those missions developed and launched and, uh, and then to operate them. So one I also want to point out is we're launching a mission you see called NISAR up there. It's the NASA India SAR mission. Uh, so Matthew John, we are doing a collaboration with, uh, with India to uh, do some earth monitoring. We'll be looking at surface deformation, uh, help us with earthquake studies, things like that. Uh, for my world, uh, um, which is, is massive amounts of data and being able to understand that, uh, this is going to return um, about uh, 100 petabytes of data, 80, about 80, 80 petabytes of data. So it's going to um, be about equal to most of the data we've ever captured from every Earth science mission we've ever flown. So you realize the complexity and things that are occurring in the new instrumentation we're actually putting on our spacecraft. So, so how many megabytes is that? Uh, well, it's, it's terabits per second, uh, but, but um, on, on uh, megabytes... So, so meg, I'll, mega, I'll, tera, peta? Uh, so, no, mega, giga. The giga, I forgot giga. Uh, that's right, and then you go to tera, right? And then you go to peta. Uh, so, think about um, how, much, how much data that is, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Gmail limits you to 20. Uh, with, 20 gigs, right? <laughs> that's, that's right. We, we're, we're, not, we're not mailing that. To, You're not uh, emailing using, it out. Using Gmail uh, kinds of tools. That's absolutely <laughs> correct. Yeah, absolutely correct. So, you know, one of, the, one of our marvels is the deep space network. And we've got um, three major locations where we actually have line of sight to our spacecraft. So uh, not too far from here in Goldstone, California, is, uh, is one of our 70-meter uh, an antennas. And there's now a number of, of other antennas, antennas there where we actually array them together to actually increase the signal strength. Uh, but we also have similar uh, sites in uh, Madrid and in Canberra. And, and the idea is, is to always you know, follow the sun so we can hand off operations as the Earth is, is rotating to be able to continue to be able to commu communicate with our spacecraft. Uh, and, uh, Not just our spacecraft, right? And actually, we do international ones as well. Right. Yeah, very. And so, uh, 
you know, the U.S. has built a lot of the infrastructure that the world actually uses, and so a lot of the negotiations we're also doing when, when uh, the Europeans fly a mission or the Indians or the Japanese is um, they're um, negotiating with the U.S. to actually use our uh, ground station infrastructure and our, um, a lot of our stations that, that exist at these sites. That's why if you go to Mission Control, there's a plate that says center of the universe. We actually are. Yeah, and it's very true. Inside of our Mission Operations Center, there's, there's a, a plaque, and it's actually a national uh, registered uh, uh, location, and you can see where it says Center of the Universe, and um, we, uh, we believe that sometimes. So. <laughs> Too often. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the uh, things to just give you some examples of, you know, so we are, when we're moving data, um, I think, uh, so our Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is an orbiter that's um, uh, taking uh, measurements and, and images of Mars as, as like a satellite, it uh, is returning data at a rate of about four megabits per second. So imagine trying to stream Netflix from Mars. Um, that, that is a challenge for us because, because more and more video would be great, but we are very bandwidth limited uh, of what we can do. And, uh, and so that really uh, drives some complexity in terms of, of how, what we can do. We have instruments that uh, are far more capable of high definition imaging than we can return over that communications link. Um, so we have to prioritize what data we bring back and our scientists help us, scientists help us do that. So that becomes uh, an important thing. Uh, Voyager 1, uh, which was launched in uh, 1977, uh, which has done the grand tour, if you've seen those pictures of the solar system, uh, you know, has passed across the edge of our Milky Way and, and is in interstellar space, um, is 14.3 billion miles away now and still operating. Um, so imagine the, that. We have, we have recorders, tape recorders on there, which was how we would, would write data. Um, so the technology we built in the 70s is still operating in, in harsh environments for, you know, radiation, where there's, there's you know, radiation and things like that occurring, uh, that we've been able to actually continue to have um, operate today. And, uh, you know, we go back to NASA, and every year we ask for continuing funding, because um, how can you shut off Voyager? Uh, it's, it's just been an amazing accomplishment uh, for mankind. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we send data back from Voyager. Uh, it's about 21 hours for us to be able to get a signal back at the speed of light. So you, that gives you an idea how far it is from, uh, from Earth. And, uh, and the challenges of being able to operate spacecraft, uh, if you're gonna send a, sign, a request up command and you get back, you're waiting for you know, 42 hours. So. so this is gonna talk about our, uh, our, our persevering land. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver in preparation for parachute deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. Skyfield maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from the world. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance yeah. safely. Yeah. getting the first image. This is the most amazing thing. This is what NASA does. This is what we can do as a country. So for those that spend their a career or part of a career on a mission, that's the seven minutes of terror. And so um, making sure it can land on Mars and uh, Mars has been very unforgiving over the years to, to many, many agencies and groups that tried to land on there. So Mark, you were there, I know. Yeah, uh, I was there in that, in that building. I wasn't in that room that you saw in the video, but I got the shirt, so. Uh, uh, it was... I did too, but mine doesn't fit right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I was in the back room, uh, and obviously we celebrated. My, my job was to, uh, was to be there and respond in case something didn't go well. So I was really glad I didn't have much to do. <laughs> a stressful environment, for, for sure. and, and uh you know, the, the emotion in that room is, is just overwhelming 
uh, when you begin to see those images back because you know you're you're um, you're waiting and all of a sudden uh, you begin to see some success that uh, is is just um, is overwhelming in, the, in that. So when we're uh, looking at that image to come down, those of us who had to work operations the next day, that was me. We just wanted to make sure that the ground was down and the sky was That's right, up. Exactly. That right was the most important. <laughs> Not like this. Yeah, ex exactly. We knew it was going to be a good day tomorrow. Yeah. W one of the one of the things that I think is is amazing about what JPL does in these is, um, you know, we we ended up landing. In, in sort of a minefield of places. Um, and for my field, we actually trained a model uh, to, to figure out how to make it land so it would avoid certain hazards. Um, and we, we uh, and so just like, like you use your GPS, the, the rover was moving around to find the perfect location, uh, almost flat. And, um, and, so, and, and we did, and, and, and we, we were a few meters, I think, from where we had originally um, planned to go. So you know, someone has described it like, you're gonna play golf, you, you tee off here in, in, say, in Pasadena, and you're going for a hole somewhere in Ireland at a course, and you're so close, you're on the edge of the cup, and you can just tap it in. That's how good our accuracy is. And, and you know, if you're, you're talking about what it is where, where we hear God, right? For me, it's mathematics. It's the fact that we can actually use math consistently and be able to predict how do we actually be able to, find, to, to do that. It's, it's an amazing, amazing part of what we do at JPL. So Lauren, why don't you talk a little about ingenuity and we're gonna move to the next slide. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, we flew a helicopter on Mars. It's not just science fiction anymore. Uh, we called it ingenuity. Um, basically it started with a conversation of, hey, we have some extra weight called ballast on the rover. And someone said, oh, there it is. There's ingenuity lifting off the surface right there. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I was there that day when we flew that, that was fun. Um, so someone said, hey, what, what, instead, of, instead of adding an you know, extra 20-pound block of metal, why don't we uh, put a helicopter in there? And the laboratory director, Charles Ilachi, at the time was a big, big proponent of this. Um, and uh, really because we knew it would be a technology demonstration, but also really awesome PR for NASA, which, by the way, is funded by your tax-paying dollars. Thanks for that. Thanks for paying taxes, because you paid all of us. <laughs> so... Um, the conversation continued until literally two years before launch. So it wasn't officially accepted as part of the rover until two years before we launched. Uh, in hindsight, I worked on a subsystem of a rover for eight years that was permanently part of the rover for sure. It took us eight years to develop it, beginning to end. And they developed this like so quick. Um, and it's difficult because the pressure here is around 760 torr when you're just walking around in our air here. That's how thick our atmosphere is. That's why planes take off and lift off. Uh, and there on Mars, it's seven torr. So you're talking about 1% atmosphere. There's not a lot of lift, if you know anything about aerodynamics. So it was really a job of ingenuity of how to fly something in an atmosphere that thin. Um, so you can imagine a GoPro camera that's equivalent to what we flew with wingspan about as long as my arms, uh, and it worked. <laughs> and in fact, I think we just accomplished flight number 13 last week. We had a problem on 14. Well, 14, I don't count that one. <laughs> Needless to say, I've been operating, part of the, uh, part of the Ingenuity uh, helicopter flights, I've been in operations doing that job, and uh, it's, it's really gone off beautifully without a hitch. So we're really, really proud of the team who actually developed that, and in such a short amount of time. It was really, really tight turnaround for them. So we want to start telling you about our, each of our stories. And if you go to the next slide, uh, so Lauren's going to be the first to just talk about what she does. OK, hi, I'm Lauren. <laughs> uh, I've worked at NASA for 11 years. Um, I actually joined NASA the same year I joined Lake Avenue Church. Um, I moved to Pasadena. I was a graduate student working at JPL as a research scientist. And I decided I really wanted to do, to do space flight uh, type stuff. I wanted to work on projects because that's all the fun, cool stuff that they show pictures of at all these outreach events. So um, I joined uh, a couple of projects and now my, my current job title is Mars 2020 Vehicle Systems Engineer. Um, it really just means I get to drive the rover. It's basically what I tell my kids. Um, and I fly a helicopter sometimes, that's pretty cool. On another planet. 
that it's, it's really fun. That's a picture of me with a flashlight. They let me get close to the rover a lot before we launched and I shined a flashlight on it. And um, were, were you actually cleaning at the time? Or is so, <laughs> no, I, so a huge part of my job was working on the sample caching system. That's the part of the rover that actually collects sample and that sample is supposed to come back to earth on the next return mission. We're kind of calling it the fetch rover. It's gonna go fetch our samples for us. So we're the first half of the first Mars sample return mission. We've never done sample return ever on Mars. Um, and a big part of my job was contamination control for the rover, specifically for that system. And so I was always in a clean room dressed like that um, uh, with a flashlight uh, picking literally single particles <laughs> off of the rover and then doing this to all the technicians who were then like cutting lacing cord all over the same area I just cleaned. Um, but most of you guys know me in the other picture. Um, I'm usually on the stage on Sunday mornings singing, doing worship, and I've been doing that here for almost 11 years. Um, yeah, thanks. I also managed to marry a really awesome guy named John, and uh, we have two adorable kids. They're pretty cool. That's my life, um, just in a snapshot. Basically, I have a family, and I have a life outside of work. I think that's really important for those of you who don't have a life outside of work. You should have a life outside of work. It's really fun. <laughs> Um, it does get difficult the closer to launch that we got. That picture in the top corner um, on the left, that's me in the clean room at um, Kennedy Space Center. Um, months before launch, I was deployed out there um, for all the pre-launch activities and I was in the Cape, at the Cape. And I was there the day they, they announced the name of Perseverance. So none of us in the clean room knew what they were gonna pick. Um, and we happened to be in the clean room working on the rover when they came in with a nameplate, Perseverance, and mounted it, and they took that picture, and that was the big press release that day. So, that's me. Can you, can you tell which one? I'm in the blue suit. Oh, yeah. Suit, right. <laughs> um, but really, that was what I look like a lot. And I, I do a lot of other fun stuff outside of JPL. I'm a CrossFit coach. I like Disneyland, and I sing a lot. There you go. Next slide. Um, I love to show this because it's true. You can kind of read for yourself, but it's what my friends think I do what my parents think I do, what you guys think I do, what my boss is, is supposed to say what my boss thinks I do on the one with the flame. It's me like, what I think I do, right? I'm really a cool astronaut. And then in reality, we really just put together PowerPoint charts a lot. So, <laughs> um, so I, I have had the privilege of a pretty awesome career at JPL. Uniquely, I've seen three launches of three missions that I've been able to work on. Um, I did do research um, prior to joining the this, this space flight. I did um, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. I actually studied the origins of life from hydrothermal vents. Yeah, let's talk about that and, and, and my faith in Christianity. That was crazy. And um, I got to work on two projects that went to the space station. So that was really fun. One was called Opals. Because of the data rate problem, we wanted to see if we could send uh, a lot more of those gigabytes through a laser beam link to the ground. And so we sent basically um, a high, defi high definition video that would normally take about six hours via radio waves that we normally use from the space station to the ground. It took us three seconds to download with the laser link. Mm -hmm. Really cool, problem is, on a rainy day, it didn't work because it's an optical link. So we still have the kinks to work out. And then OCO3 was my other project, which also is still operating on the space station now. Really fun. Um, it's still collecting a lot of great CO2 data. And then the top uh, other picture up there is I had the privilege of working at Johnson Space Center before I came to California and I worked on the space shuttle. And I got to do uh, space shuttle operations and inspections there. It was really fun. This is what I looked like every day for six years. <laughs> so I'm not gonna lie, when the pandemic hit and everyone said, put your mask on, I was like, no, because I thought I was done with masks, finally. Um, but I literally had to uh, go into these clean rooms. I created these clean rooms. And um, just so you know, the average air that you're breathing right now in Los Angeles, it's disgusting. There's like a million particles per square foot, per cubic foot of air. 
And in this clean your room. Mask, your mask won't help you. Yeah, sorry, the mask won't. Um, let's not talk about that. That's the COVID next week. Um, so <laughs> so the, the clean room that we had to build the sample caching system in, it had to be so clean because we were going to bring back these samples, right? This is going to be the future of humanity. Graduate students for years will study these samples. You don't want to find Mark's hair in the sample, right? Okay. <laughs> She wouldn't let me in the room. I, no, I often smell tested people, okay? Literally, I had to make, I, I required no smokers, so none of the technicians could smoke. You had to use special deodorant shampoo, the whole nine yards. And in our clean room where we built this, it was a, it was a thousand uh, particles per cubic foot. So that's the difference between outside air and in there, and we had to dress like that, and it was really fun. It wasn't fun. Uh, lastly, my job as uh, operations engineer, um, it's been so cool because I helped design the sample caching system, develop it, clean the heck out of it, launch it, and now I got to see the pictures of the actual cores being taken on Mars just a couple of weeks ago. So awesome, so gratifying, big success, and I'm going to hand it off now to the next. Great. Next slide. All right, next slide. Thank you, Lauren. So, um, Mark, Mark Underwood. Thank you. Uh, this is my picture. It's actually on a cruise in Alaska. Um, I'm mission insurance manager. I've been mission insurance manager for Mars 2020 for about five years. And uh, uh, specialty mission insurance, I came, come from a power background, so when we talk about Voyager, um, it's because of the power that they're able to keep going. Uh, I've been at Lake Avenue Church for 34 years, and I probably know many of you if I could actually see you, but the lighting here is terrible. Um, next slide. So what does a mission insurance manager do? I'm, I'm a member of the, uh, the, the project management team, so I work directly for the project manager, um, responsible for mission success. So my, my responsibility is to make sure that everything works right and that people design, build, test uh, the assemblies uh, and software uh, exactly as, as to the right standards and as, as expected. So it's gonna work. And uh, the fun, really fun part about the job is it requires uh, a lot of technical insight into virtually everything, everything that has to be done on to get a, a rover, to get a, a project to the, to the surface. Now, I, I, I don't know everything, <clears throat> even though I think I'd like to. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I have to depend on my team, but, but I have to have enough insight to understand and assess uh, whether that's being done right and, uh, and depend on the team to make sure that works. Uh, there's a couple pictures there, uh, the one on the, uh, on the right is an is a expanded view of the rover as a, a per Perseverance as it was entering Mars um, with crew stage on top, which delivered it to Mars. Uh, aero shell encapsulating the, the rover and, and the back, back shell or the, uh, the descent stage, which had the rockets on it. You saw that in the video when it was uh, descending onto Mars. Um, I'll talk about the heat shield in a moment. And then the other picture shows the seven instruments uh, that are on, on Perseverance. Uh, three of those were built um, uh, overseas, and so I had the privilege of uh, uh, going to Norway and France and Spain to help uh, assure that those instruments were, done, were built right. Um, and uh, I don't think no, many people know this, but uh, SuperCam, the principal investigator for SuperCam, uh, is a uh, former member of Lake Avenue Church. He now lives in Los Alamos, but uh, he, he, I met him here. He's a very, very nice man. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this picture here is the looking down from the descent stage just before the rover touches down on the surface. Um, uh, an actual picture, first time it's ever been taken. Um, so mission insurance, uh, talk a little bit about what that uh, responsibility for um, overseeing, making sure that it's all done right. Um, this slide mostly talks about anomalies and problems and whenever you're building something complicated, especially for the first time, stuff goes wrong. Some things happen, and my, my uh, job is to help make sure those get understood, uh, resolved, make sure they never happen again. And a couple examples, uh, that heat shield I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, the, the original flight heat shield, uh, we put it through a, a test to see if it could uh, in, endure the pressure it was going to see when it was entering the Mars, Martian atmosphere, and it broke. Uh, it literally cracked most of the way around, and uh, that was a bad day. <laughs> but we were really happy that happened on the ground, happened in test, and not on the way to Mars, or else we'd have lost perseverance. So my job was to help make sure that we understood what happened, um, 
why it, why it failed and that we could rebuild another one and uh, make it better and go through the proper test, make sure it, was, uh, it would not fail. Uh, we always test with margin, we call it, so about 125% was the goal on that test of what it would have, would have seen on Mars. And of course, uh, Perseverance was successfully delivered to Mars, so it worked. Uh, the second, second one is uh, one of our partners, um, they were doing a similar uh, a, a thermal test on their, on their hardware, uh, and the, uh, the oven ran away, uh, melted the flight hardware, which was uh, another really bad day, um, <clears throat> several million dollars, tens of millions of dollars. Um, and uh, my job was to help make sure we understood what happened. And when an oven runs away, it's pretty obvious what happened, but there's a lot of detail behind uh, why we let that happen and uh, what pr processes and procedures need to be done better so it doesn't happen again. Rebuilt the hardware on an accelerated schedule and redid the test, and it passed, and now it's on Mars. Next slide. Uh, the other responsibility I have as a mission insurance manager is I'm the uh, safety and mission insurance technical authority, which is a, a delegated responsibility from NASA to assess risks uh, for and, and advise the project manager and the JPL management and uh, NASA the independent assessment of the risk of the project, uh, whether or not uh, we're, we're properly um, uh, managing that risk so that we can have, a good, have good success keeping the risk low. Uh, what else did I have on that one? Yeah, yeah accept those risks uh, uh, at the project level. So in that picture there is a selfie that taken by uh, Perseverance, uh, which is, I keep looking at it and thinking, where is the arm? The arm's sticking out there like this and looking back at itself, but the, the arm's not in the picture. I don't understand how they do that. Um, but you can see the shadow, the shadow of the uh, turret, which is where the camera is. Yeah, and they stitch it all together, yeah, right? And, and the rock at the, at the bottom is the rock where we took the two, uh, um, two cores uh, uh, simultaneous so we can decide when, we, when it's time to bring them back, which one will bring back one another way and another, another way and make sure one of them, at least one of them works um, for re sample return. So uh, I think that's my last slide. Great, thank you, Mark. So, so yeah, absolutely. So our next story is gonna come from Mike Ressler. Um, All right. So um, you go next slide, please. My name is Mike. Um, I'm an astronomer and principal scientist at JPL. And my job is to torture the engineers and especially the mission assurance managers. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> the good thing, Lauren, you're in the middle. So, so they, they, they never let scientists touch the flight hardware. So that picture you see of me, Every now and then I get to go in the clean room, but that's actually not one of the flight uh, sensors, flight detectors, that's, that's an engineering model. So when we did build the flight detectors, I made sure nobody was looking and then went. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had gloves on. Um, so I'm the project scientist for two missions that uh, JPL's working on. Uh, so you already heard a little bit about the mid-infrared instrument on James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, that's actually a partnership with uh, some European astronomical institutes, and so I've gotten to meet a lot of people in Europe over the last 24 years. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and we definitely look forward to seeing that launch at the end of the year. Um, at about the same time COVID hit, I uh, was invited to be the project scientist for another mission, the Near-Earth Object Surveyor. Um, in this mission, we're doing a most-of-the-sky survey uh, looking for asteroids that might impact Earth someday. Um, our, our, you know, hero punchline is, you know, finding them before they find us. Um, so, um, so I'm, we've been at it for about a year. Um, well, I've been at it for about a year. Uh, the project itself is much longer. Um, but it's a lot of fun because I'm an astronomer, a scientist, but I've also done enough engineering to be dangerous, which is why the engineers really hate me, because I know how to ask questions. Um, but that's one of my jobs as a project scientist. So I've been at Lake Avenue, let's see, for 29 years. Uh, almost all that time I've been involved with the Galilean Sunday School class. <laughs> and I play in the community orchestra and do a whole bunch of other things, but uh, pleased to be here. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, frog in the throat. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what, when I say I work in, with infrared detectors, what, is, what does that mean? What does that do for us? Um, 
So actually, I should say, unlike everybody else here, I'm not a Martian. I'm part of the and beyond. Um, so what I do is I look at the universe in different ways. Um, you know, everybody knows what it's like to look through a telescope and, you know, look at Mars <laughs> or, or Saturn or, you know, some gas cloud or something. Um, and that's one way of looking at the universe, but we get more information by looking at the universe in different ways. And so the picture up on the screen right now is, um, you know, a little, little patch of the sky near the constellation of Cassiopeia. Um, and you'll notice there's some dark, dark patches. Um, those are actually clouds of gas and dust, and this is where stars form. And so one of my scientific interests is how do stars form? And so if we want to see stars forming, we have to be able to see where they're born. And so if we look at that same patch of sky in the infrared, uh, all of a sudden, th those dark areas, you see these kind of purplish looking things popping out. Um, these are infrared wavelengths that our eyes can't normally see, but we color code it so that we can. Um, but by looking in the infrared, we see down to where those stars are forming and we can learn something about um, how that process works. And so what I do is figure out ways where we can observe the universe at infrared wavelengths. Most people don't know that JPL is also a specialist in infrared astronomy, which is part of why I'm there. Uh, we flew the Spitzer Space Telescope in the 2000s, and that's part of how we got involved with one of the instruments on JWST. Um, so these are just a couple of things uh, that I do. So I tried to come up with, you know, my primary day job now is a project scientist. What's a project scientist? It's my job to translate what the scientists want to do into things or requirements that engineers can build and project managers can afford to pay for. <laughs> and it's kind of an interesting balancing act. Um, the, the way JPL is supposed to work, there's a project manager who controls everything. And then the, as a project scientist, I'm his or her peer. I don't have any real authority. You know, nobody gives me any power. But it's actually my signature on the dotted line that says, yes, we built something that's going to do the science that the scientific community asks for. So until I sign it, it doesn't fly. Um, so I can't influence anything along the way, but you still have to convince me it's going to work. Um, and so it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I work with some really great people, uh, a lot of great uh, teams that I've worked on over the years. Um, and if anything is true at JPL, is nothing is a one-man or one-person show. Um, teams make everything happen. Um, so a couple things in there, some infrared detectors up at the top, like I was holding that other picture. Um, there's a filter wheel that was part of our instrument. That's the kind of thing where the scientists say, I want to observe these stars at these different wavelengths. And it's like, okay, how do we, how do we use filters to select which wavelength we want to look at? And so that led to the requirements for that filter wheel. Um, I do a lot of uh, software for data analysis and then at the uh, right side there is, uh, it's a star that's actually in the process of dying that I discovered in one of the other missions I worked on at visible wavelengths, that bluish color. It just kind of looks round and blobby. But when we looked at it in the infrared, we saw those two orange colored rings around it. And we still don't know exactly what they are. Um, that's one of the things I'm going to observe with uh, James Webb once it's up and working. Um, so anyway, I do a little bit of everything, um, what, but what do you, what do that's you my job as a scientist. Rings? Just rings. <laughs> it's, not, not, it's not a cage or something like no. that? No. Okay. Um, when, when the press release came out, somebody took a can of tuna and tilted it on its side and said, it looks exactly like a tilted can of tuna, and which led to many jokes about things we don't need to get into. <laughs> good memes on the internet. Yes, that. definitely some memes on the internet, but um, it's good fun. Great. All right, Dan, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Mike. So, so <clears throat> my story of, of working at JPL actually uh, began pretty young. Um, so I'm, I'm a second generation JPLer. Um, my, my father, Jerry Crichton, it was the first generation and he actually worked on the Voyager and Mariner and the Deep Space Network and many of the software capabilities that we actually still use today. So, um, so he was a great influence on me. Uh, and uh, I remember him coming home with um, 
a, a computer and a printer that would print out what the computer said, right? We had no monitors at that, in those times. And uh, when I was about 12 years old, uh, we were trying to decide what we were going to get for Christmas, and it was either a dirt bike or a, com or a, a IBM PC computer that was just coming out. And uh, he, got the, he got the computer. Um, and so, uh, so I learned to program that, and uh, he and, and some of his friends uh, hired me when I was 14 to help uh, do a JPL project, a little side project to port software from a CPM environment to DOS. And, uh, and so I started doing more and more with computers uh, at a very young age uh, and, uh, and went through and got my education and came to JPL in, in, in 1995. Um, and so I've been there 27 years, and my role is, is as a, a computer scientist, and, and I um, s serve in, in really helping JPL think about where it's going to go in the future with being able to use data and computing really to, um, to press the, the, the forefront of what we need to do on our missions and, and for our scientists. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a great privilege for me to be able to, to, to do that. Um, on, the, uh, on the upper right is some colleagues I had is touring uh, the inside of the mission control. Um, on the bottom right is a picture of me in Moscow. Uh, I was there to help work with the Russians. They were flying, starting to work on uh, their own rover and some of their own activities with some called ExoMars. Uh, and uh, we were talking about how we could begin to get some of that data back. Um, and then in the middle, um, I, I was uh, in, in uh, 2018, in the summer, I went to the, the University of Bristol. I was a, a, a fellow there for a week um, and uh, worked with them in terms of, of, of uh, sharing what NASA was doing and, and so forth. So, and, and by the way, I, I'm, I've been at, at, at Lake with my beautiful wife and two kids for 24 years and uh, involved in, in Sunday school classes and in, in leadership as well. Um, so, so what is this picture telling you? Uh, you know, you, you've heard about, uh, you know, what it takes to be able to get data back and, and so forth um, to be able to do that analysis. What you see in the upper left is we've got all kinds of, of instrumentation sensors that are taking measurements. Uh, those are in, in uh, all edges of our solar system, the returning data back. Um, what, uh, what, what is a challenge is that the computing on that is, is, is something called a RAD 750. It has less compute power than my iPhone. Uh, and uh, so we have to figure out how to pack software into very, very uh, limited environments. And the reason for that is because the radiation we get, we can't fly normal CPUs, memory kinds of, of uh, things that you would actually nor uh, have in your uh, home computer or things like that. And so uh, we do a, a lot to figure out how do we um, operate in such an environment as that. What you see on the upper right is, um, it's not moving, but, there, but uh, you can maybe see those rectangles um, what we've learned to do is figure out how to put more autonomy uh, on, on this. So this is, this is the, the ability to make it think on its own, and that's actually tracking dust devils that move across the surface. And so we actually, just like if you go up, upload your um, picture to Facebook and it says, oh, I think that's Lauren or Mark or something like that, we're, we're training um, algorithms on the ground to say that looks like a moving dust storm. And then we upload the output of that model to, as software um, on board, and then we can train and get, get our uh, software to be more and more smart. And that helps us actually manage the, the communications link because we don't have to return that data to Earth. We can begin to compute right at the edge of collection. And that's part of our goal as we move forward to figure out how to scale a mission is put more and more compute power in the future and autonomy capabilities onto our spacecraft. Right, so Perseverance takes a Dust Devil movie almost every day, right? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> exactly, exactly. We so have, it, We have videos of it. We have videos yeah. of it, yeah. So, so we, we, we built that software. And then, um, Thanks, Pat. And then uh, <laughs> we have uh, a massive amounts of, of data that's being, being returned to our, through our antennas. Um, we're, we're taking all that data and we're uh, then processing that. And we actually support at JPL the worldwide science community. So all of our data is public. It's, it's um, uh, an uh, um, artifact of taxpayer money, uh, and uh, by mandate, by federal mandate, we make that available and work with agencies all over the world to um, share and support science advancement. Um, and so one of the things that, that I worked on um, is uh, I led a team that, that built the, the, the standard for all planetary data. Um, and so every agency in the world now uses that. Um, and so part of my travels was to figure out how do we get and build teams. And so, we, you know, we think about what JP do, JPL does, we work a lot, 
in trying to figure out how to build agreements and, and create teams and, and work with international partners. Very, very multicultural, very, very international in terms of how we have to operate. So it, for me, it's been a privilege because I've been able to, to travel the world to be able to talk to these groups and really be able to help um, bring, bring all of that, that's, this together. Um, and so this is one of the things that we did is we stitched together um, massive amounts of our Mars data. So if you've gone to Google Earth and you've been able to go off and explore kind of that or you use sort of Google Maps, um, we did a JPL version of this from Mars. Uh, and uh, when the, the movie The Martian came out, uh, the, the popular press got a hold of the tool. So there's actually um, on the bottom right from the book, uh, The Martian is Mark w uh, Watney. And they plotted where he landed in the book to where they, he found and recovered the spacecraft. Um, and uh, so this, they're able to use this. We have elevation maps. So we're actually taking um, topology and being able to create these kinds of maps from the data that we're measuring. And we're, they're able to estimate how far that was away using some of our tooling. Um, and so one of the other things that I've been able to do is, is uh, uh, work to take what we do in, at JPL in terms of science and physical science and, and start to work in, in other areas. And so you hear about how space capabilities can benefit mankind. So I tend to, I, I worked for about 15 years as a principal scientist for the National Cancer Institute, helping them take compute technologies that we do to look at how we analyze science data. And now we're doing that for cancer research. And so what you see on the, uh, the upper right is the ability for us to take things like radiology imaging, pathology imaging, and run uh, algorithms that help us look for disease progression, uh, look at things over time, be able to characterize that, and to be able to, to train and find those kinds of signatures, if you will, in, in some of the data. So imaging is, is mass amounts of data, and we're learning to figure out how do we extract insight from that, and how do we automate and build computing capabilities to do that. It's a picture of me on the bottom right just before COVID. My wife and I had an opportunity to go to the University of Tokyo and participate in a uh, science meeting there uh, with other researchers from, um, from around the world that were looking at cancer research. And I gave a talk on, on what JPL is doing. Um, and then the bottom left, which is not moving but, but could move, is um, we're taking VR technology, so virtual reality. And we're taking, because imaging is moving to 3D, we're beginning to characterize what the data looks like in three dimensions and be able to give scientists VR goggles that helps them be able to walk around and look at uh, the data and be able to, to better understand it by being able to look at it in, uh, in more of a, a new dimension if you, you could from looking at on two dimensional kinds of, of imaging. So, so that is, uh, if we go to the next slide, I think that's, that is our story. Uh, and uh, I'm at this point, I'm gonna invite Beth Paz to come up and uh, she's gonna give us some instructions. Can we thank our panel this evening? Fascinating. This has been an incredible uh, amount of information. Thank you for making your worlds accessible to us in, in such a, a great way. Hey, we're gonna take a quick break, okay? Uh, we've got 10 minutes for you, and we want you to get to know someone else, share about what struck you from this presentation so far. Outside, we have a local business, um, Coney Island Creamery, who is bringing us sweet treats this evening of their delicious, uh, locally crafted, ice cream, there's coffee and some other desserts in the back. If you want to leave a donation, all of that is going to fund our Friends of International Students, which is a local ministry also set up outside for you to learn about. They do some incredible work here in the LA area and we want to support them with the proceeds of the evening. We are gonna move into Q&A. And so we have three by five cards right here. We've got pens for you. Take a minute. There was a lot of information there, but bring us your questions. We can't wait to dive into more specifics and stories when we return in 10 minutes. All right, have a great break. So this is always encouraging to get so many questions and that, that's a great, um, great way to kind of gauge how it is going, where it is going. So uh, again, uh, apologies in advance that if we cannot get to all of these questions, uh, but I promise I am going to get these guys 
uh, one more time at some time, depending on when, you know, where their schedule line up, it's like the stars aligning. <laughs> they have very, very busy schedules, but I'm pretty sure that I can get them one more time so that we can continue some of this conversation and answer all, our, all your questions. So I'm going to keep this if I cannot get to them, okay? So, um, now, I'm, since I'm joining the panel, I feel like my IQ has gone up 20 points. Now I'm sitting in the middle of all these amazing guys. Um, so, uh, some of these questions, by the way, may not be your questions, but one way or the other, many questions seem parallel. There is a parallel theme to it, so it might get answered in the way. This is a very simple and direct question, and I also want to know the answer to this. Um, you can... Uh, choose to one, or all of you can respond, maybe. This is a question like that. What is it to be a Christian at JPL? What it is to be a Christian at JPL? Who wants to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tackle that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it, what is it like to be a Christian, or is it, what, what is, is it? What is it to be a Christian, be? yeah. I, I would say uh, it, it is actually scary <laughs> uh, for the most part because I used to tell Greg Waybright that I am in a mission field and it's the toughest one of them all. It's the intellectual field. And everyone around you, you think your IQ feels you know, intimidated here at this table. My IQ feels intimidated when I go to work because there are a lot more people who are even miles more than I am. And how do you approach these people <laughs> to talk about Jesus? I, I remember having a conversation with my advisor when I was doing origin of life studies under him at JPL. And we were casually sitting outside talking, and he said, oh, that would be such a stupid thing to do, <laughs> almost as dumb as, you know, believing in God. And I, <laughs> I kind of chuckled to myself, and he looked at me, and went, you know, what's so funny? And I, I just said, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. <laughs> and, and I was terrified. I was terrified to say that. But at the same time, um, I just felt the power of the Holy Spirit at the same time, and he had no idea what to say <laughs> in response to that. And I think the other thing is throughout my career, in particular, I've experienced a lot of um, persecution in a lot of different ways at JPL. Um, not necessarily directed at me because people knew I was a Christian, but maybe because um, I always tried to do the right thing, and not everybody has that kind of integrity. and. You know, even recently, there's just been a lot of challenges for me at work, and I go back to the scripture every time, and I, and I read in the Psalms that says, integrity and honesty protect me, the Lord is my shield. And I think that's such a calling when you look at people like Daniel in the Bible. Um, I always look at him because he was at the upper echelon of his mm. career with crazy Babylonian um, culture, and he maintained his integrity throughout that whole thing. So I think it's scary, I would say, in my opinion, but maybe you guys have a different one. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, there are some people who are openly hostile. Um, there are some people that just don't care. Um, what I found out is there are more of us than you might think. That's true. Um, That's true. You know, it, in, uh, you know, particularly in a big project, you know, you think, you know, scientists and Christians, you know, they never mix. Um, well, I'm not going to name names, but there are a lot of Christians on some big projects that NASA is very famous for. So we're out there. It's true. Yeah, I've also noticed that, um, um, that once you get to know people, uh, people are people everywhere. They have insecurities and problems and questions and concerns. And, and uh, uh, you know, God has the answers. The Bible has the answers uh, to the questions of life uh, that science really can't address. And it's uh, sometimes fun to sit down and talk with people about that, um, no matter what their intellectual background. Yeah. Well, me being in Pasadena, this also surprised me how many Christians are there at JPL, you know. Um, I'm also 
not going to name names, but I, I don't work for JPL, so I don't care. But I'm going to tell you something. April, uh, May 21, Saturday, 2022, May 21, Saturday, General Larry James, who is the top guy at JPL, who is the number one guy at JPL, is going to be here in this pulpit. He will, sorry? He's uh, interim, he's, uh, he's sorry. Interim number one. Yeah, yeah. Interim, number one. interim number one, but anyway. <laughs> He's above all of you guys, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's the boss. So, he's the big boss. So he will be here, and he will be, tell, you know, I mean, obviously he's a Christian, a very strong one there is, and he's an active part of a church and all that kind of stuff. So it is very, very awe-inspiring and humbling for someone like me to see, you know, this intellectual community there uh, in the, you know, making an impact in the culture. Right? So more than the technology, you're impacting the culture. So I'm, I'm very proud to be you know, in that circle, even at least from the sideline. So the other question is even more important, actually. <laughs> what is it to be a scientist in the church? The other question was, what is it to be a, a Christian in the in, a JPL? Now, this could be a little tricky. What is, what is it like to be a scientist at Lake Avenue Church? That's a specific question, but generally in the church. Any persecutions? <laughs> I think that can be sometimes a, a tough, tough thing. I think sometimes we don't always talk about um, our, our workspace, or sometimes, you know, if we're looking at science, is, uh, is there controversy around, particularly you get in areas like climate science and caring and stewarding our um, our, our environment, our earth, and people say, well, why do we do this? Why do we do that? The, the thing that, um, that I, I see is through what I do, my, strength is, is my, my faith is strengthened because um, the more I, I, I learn about science, the more I learn and see what we can do in technology and mathematics, the more I, I see that there, there, there has to be a God. It's just, it's, it's, I'm convinced. And uh, so... Um, you know, it's it's something that that where I, where I can come back to Lake Avenue and others and bridge that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, conversations like this are so important for being able to have have that um, that, that 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 bridging. You know. I mean, you know, a lot of people will ask me, you know, as as a as a Christian, how can you be a scientist? Because science and faith are opposed to each other, or something. It's like, no, they're not. Um, you know. There, there's a lot of debate that's kind of needless, um, but you know, I don't believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. I believe it's 13 point, well, the universe is 13.7 billion years old because that's what I see as I do my science. Um, but that's, that's how I get to know God, how I get to understand who he is and what he's created. Um, is that other picture, uh, the starry background picture available in the slides? There it is. So, you know, you look around the sanctuary, and it's like, you know, our sanctuary is kind of nice. Um, you know, it's certainly big. And, uh, you know, Michelangelo did a nice job on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. But this is my cathedral up in that picture. Hmm. The starry sky, you know, there's some trees hmm. around the corners. But I see God when I look out there. Um, you know, I see his fingerprints on creation. And you might call me a little nuts, but we do have an organized universe that we are capable of comprehending. You know, we write mathematical equations to describe the laws that we see in the universe, but the fact is there are laws. Um, to me, that's, that's the sign of something more than just a random, a random process. You know, it, it gives me the ability to believe that there, is a, that there is a God and a God who loves me because he's made it so that I can respond to his creation so, so well. So, you know, this is a picture I took myself. I just put a camera on a, on a picnic bench and shot up one night uh, when we were up camping. Um, but it really is. I love being out in the desert or anywhere. There was a big view of the sky, dark, dark sky at night. Um, that's when I'm closest to God. No offense to the worship team, but <laughs> you really want to get me into it, put me out in the desert. I'll work on some better PowerPoints. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did study the origins of life in my science research, and I did get <laughs> some criticism from some, from some Christians. So I do want to say it's funny how you can get criticized both ways, 
uh, yeah. like, you know, at work for being a Christian, but at church for being a scientist. And you're kind of wondering, does anybody think that this is a good idea? And did God really call me to do this? But uh, it's funny because I think I grew up really sheltered. I was actually homeschooled in Texas in a really tiny town. I grew up in a really poor family. I was first generation to even go to college in my family. And so everyone I grew up with stayed in that little town. And I swear, I think they were terrified to do science because I, they might discover God's not real. And in reality, it's so good for your faith to be an engineer and a scientist at JPL because you have to grapple with, well, wait a minute, most Christians think the earth is only like 14,000 years old. I held a meteorite from Mars in my hand that was 3.1 billion years old. How, how does that work? And I had to grapple with that and my faith and say, no, this doesn't, this doesn't prove God doesn't exist. It proves how incredibly com complicated the universe is that he created. And there's so much more to God than I even knew when I began that journey in science. I think that's kind of like what yeah, you I, said. I like to think of it, you know, if, if, you, if you think you're a big shot on the earth, I'll show you that picture, you know, change your mind a little bit. You, you know, we as individuals, the fact that God loves us is just absolutely amazing yeah. because really we have no right to expect anything and yet God loved us anyway. Um, that's amazing. That's funny. One of the questions was actually, how old is the earth? Uh, but I didn't, I didn't want to read it because I didn't want to trip you, but you already bought into, you know, you dug your own grave in that sense. <laughs> By the way, it's but not 14, it's not 14,000, it's 6,000 years old. There's, so. uh, <laughs> I found out because Lake Avenue Church, like eight years ago, had like multiple panels on this. Yeah. And I found out there was like 11 different views on the creation story within the Christian church. I had, I thought there was like literally one. We're not going there, Lauren, we're not no. going there. <laughs> Just read Hugh Ross's book, it's really good. Hugh Ross. Ross. Yeah, yeah. Read his book. Yeah. Um, so uh, the next question is somewhat related to this. Uh, why is it important for the church to have these kind of discussions? I think that's a good question. That kind of the legitimacy of this platform in a way. Why do you? Why is it important for a church to have these kind of discussions? I think. I think for from my perspective, that it's 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 really an opportunity for us to um, grow in our understanding of one another. And um, I think it's, it, um, I mean, j just like us sitting around the table, I think somebody commented during the break, oh, wow, you know, you guys are all so different, but yet, you know, we need, you know, you need to put all of you together in order to, to make a JPL. And the church needs to put all of us together in order to be the, the, the a church. And so these perspectives, if we can integrate them and understand it, I think, I think it increases our um, ability to, to be a, a, a more intimate community. Uh, to be able to um, know how to how to uh, be in, in a family and in a church together, mm -hmm. and um, really to uh, also um, spur each other on to, to learn more about God and, and, and what He is doing. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants to add? Yeah, just to uh, highlight that that it's an artificial divide to uh, to separate the church from anything secular. Uh, we we are all. That's, that's where we live, that's who we are. Um, I believe that's where call, God called me. Um, we talked about calling. Um, you know, I, I wasn't called to be a missionary or a pastor, uh, but I'm an engineer, and that's what God made me to do. And uh, it's part of, part of what the community is. Well, the next question is the, comes at it from another angle, you know, forgetting the church for a minute. Why is science and exploration of space itself is important to humanity? Forget God and, you know, all that for a minute. But why is it so important for us to discover this? And that's the question, I guess. Human yeah. beings are amazingly curious creatures. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of my favorite jokes is, you know, why do people climb mountains? Because they're there. Um, <laughs> and you, you can say that a lot about the science you know, what we do in science. Why do, why do we do things? Why do we explore these things? Well, because they're there. Um, you know, as a Christian, I might say, because that's part of the universe God created and I want to figure out how he did it. Um, but, um, you know, it's, um, it's fun and humans really are <laughs> curious. Um, 
but uh, you know, it, it's, it, it gives us a chance to explore who we are and how we relate to God. And, um, if any of you used your GPS today, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that's my answer. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, this kind of on the same line, how does the exploration of space and science impact your faith in God? Like I said, most of the questions have kind of similar tone, so part of it you probably already answered. I think one of the, one of the things I find um, really, really compelling is, uh, and I, I've heard this, this, you know, when the, um, you know, Apollo 11 landed on, on the moon and um, you had the astronauts sitting in there, um, I heard they did communion um, because they looked back and they saw this little blue ball and uh, they began to realize, look at what God created in the perfect place um, with, with all of its majesty of, what, of, of this earth and the Garden of Eden, the universe, as I think somebody has said. And um, mm -hmm. w when we go out, the, you know, some of the plants are very pretty, but it's a very harsh, harsh um, space. And uh, God has protected us right here. Hmm. Um, next question, actually, uh, if there is a... If there is an award for the best question, they should get it. So this is, <laughs> unfortunately there isn't, but where are the aliens from and when did God create them? <laughs> it's not like, are there aliens? Where are they from? <laughs> in the basement of JPL building, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's a, that's a my question. He's the astrophysicist, yeah, right? Yeah, he knows. <laughs> yeah. well, it's a Lauren question. Uh, oh, so she's, well, a, she's an astrobiologist, right? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I, yeah. don't, I don't know where they are, but <laughs> there seems to be this uh, conspiracy theory that NASA is hiding what we know about aliens. Trust me, scientists cannot keep their mouth shut. <laughs> if we had actually found aliens, you would know. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and you know that the, the one of the reasons we're trying to bring samples back from Mars is to look for signs of ancient life, um, and you can do that if you actually have it in your hands. Um, and and it's it it's it's a it's a very difficult question to think about. Well, if there's life out there that's different than life here, what happened? How did that start? Um, origins of life questions. And, and, and there are theological implications um, what, in terms of our understanding of how God created, um, created us. And it's, not a, it's not, a, not a simple question. I spent a few years at Johnson Space Center studying Martian meteorites. So I already, it's called poor man sample return. Yeah, That's right. we got it for free. And I actually, my, my whole job in that research position was looking for microbes in the rock and proving they were Martian and not just earth contamination. And uh, I wrote a couple papers, I published the papers, they're very controversial. They hit international news and all this stuff. But it was fascinating because some of my Christian friends were like, so you believe there's alien life on Mars? And I said, well, actually, yeah, I think there used to be microbes. I think there's probably evidence there of microbial life. We might find some in some samples. It'd be really fascinating. And again, it's like people were like afraid as Christians to discover life on another planet, somehow that just means God isn't really God. But I'm telling you, if you read the Bible, read it. It's really good. There's nothing bigger than God. And it would just be another cool thing about God that he created microbes on Mars and then decided to kill them off. And that would be a great bucket list question when I get to heaven. So what happened there, you know? <laughs> I, I, for one, can't wait to ask him. But I will say I've learned what questions are I call them rib issues versus like spinal cord. It's like God, the, you know, the fact that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and loves me and he is my salvation and he is my way, that doesn't change if there's life on Mars or if there's alien life here on earth hiding under Dan's basement. I'm sure it's there. <laughs> um, the next question is very similar. I think you already answered, but I'm just putting it out there if anybody wants to add something. How does your faith complement or interact um, with the search to find life on other planets? 
And there is another question uh, from someone else. What other planners would be next to explore? Uh, explain, yeah, and this is another question, but explain time and seasons in Mars. Mars is a season like winter. That's a good question. Yep. Really? Yeah. Do you want to tackle that? Yeah. Well, just see the seasons. The weather. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, the Earth has seasons because the, goes, as it goes around the sun, the, the axis of the rotation is tilted. So the Earth, you know, has, yeah, you see the sun move up and back, back and forth in the sky. And the same thing happens on Mars. Uh, it's a different tilt, but same idea. And so uh, we're currently in Martian summer yeah. on for Perseverance. Yeah. And uh, it's important for uh, thermal reasons to make sure we can survive through the winter. Yeah, the average, the average temperatures change seasonally on Mars, just like they do Earth. It's actually more extreme because we have less atmosphere. So you see, you know, minus 135 degrees Celsius is what we had to test for all of our hardware. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that uh, people might be interested in is that when folks go work on um, a Mars mission, when it's operating, they, they sometimes move to Mars. They um, begin to work on Martian time, uh, and so they're trying to figure out how to get up when it's uh, a certain time in Mars, and go to bed when it's a certain time, and that's shifting because Mars has a, a, a longer, longer day. Twenty-four hour and forty-five minute day. For three months, we literally call ourselves Martians when we were in operations. Mark, you got to enjoy some of this. Just a little. And I did it for three months. I literally had a changing schedule every day. So imagine changing time zones every single day for three mm. months. You never catch up. It was rough, <laughs> <laughs> but we got through it. And no, I really don't understand why we do that. Really, <laughs> honestly, but. We, we were, we were uh, slave to the Martian day, soul. We call those souls, by the way. That's right. Yes, soul. Oh, and the next planet is probably Europa. Oh. And it's not a planet, it's a moon. Um, what excites you about working for JPL? You know, I, I, I think about that question, and, uh, you know, this, this stuff we do is, is fascinating. It's a lot of fun, and it, it's challenging. But what really excites me about JPL is working with the different people we get to work with. You know, and um, uh, that's true with lots of jobs, but uh, you get a chance to interact with people uh, that are very different, but very special. And uh, it's really fascinating to be able to, to, to have that kind of uh, interaction. Um, and sometimes very deep interaction on, on a very deep level with, with lots of different people. Yeah, the teams are part of it. The fact that we do a lot of international collaborations, so I get to meet people from, from all over the place um, who are coming from different cultures and different viewpoints is, is interesting. So it's, it's just a chance to, to work with the best. And one of the things that uh, I think is really um, just unique and, and I think just a, a lot of fun for, to be at JPL is we've got a, a kind of an innovative and can-do spirit. Um, you know, our, our mission is really not to do the same thing over and over again. Uh, that, you know, we, we hand, we're supposed to hand things off to industry. As NASA's research center, um, you know, we, we really want to try and do the impossible and push the envelope. And so um, crazy ideas sometimes become reality. We fly a helicopter on Mars, you know, so. Or, yeah. or the sky crane, as I was talking with someone yeah. at the break. You know, that's a pretty crazy idea. It worked. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just say, uh, I remember we had a campaign here at Lake years ago called Be Part of Something Bigger. And I always thought about that in the context of our job, right? I, it, no one person can say, I did the whole rover by myself. <laughs> there was 2,500 people at one point on the project, maybe more than that. Um, that's how many people it took to do that. And by the way, we didn't all have the same culture, mindset, even language. And we all had to put aside our own you know, personal things to accomplish that mission. And isn't that a wonderful example of what a church can be, you know, as that ties back to our faith in the churches. It, sometimes I worked better with my team at JPL than, <laughs> than in agreement with my church family. And, you know, it, it's, it's funny how when you're launching something to another planet or um, to observe our universe, it, sometimes you're, it's easier for you to turn that emotional side of yourself off because you have to, and then you come to church and you can't. <laughs> so it's an interesting... Lauren, I can't hear you. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> uh, 
Well, um, on that note, I was, not going, I was not going to ask this question, but I'm going to now. Uh, this, <laughs> this is how it reads. With missions becoming more and more international, how has politics affected the process? Has it lengthened the time for completion? It's always been political, okay. always. Like the history of NASA has been political. Sputnik went up, we had to make something in response. That was Explorer 1. Uh, the Russians were like, we're going to put a man on the moon. Then our president at the time was like, oh, no, we're going to put a man on the moon. It's, it's always been political. I worked on a project that got canceled twice by Congress, twice. And it still launched. And I really didn't think that was going to happen. So, and it's always been a political decision up here. I think that's just part of the gig. It really is. So, some of my, uh, my colleagues have always been... Um, uh, amazed that if you go to, you know, the U.S. has its challenges of how to come together, but if you look at things like the European Space Agency, uh, which is a sort of a federation of many countries, um, they're trying to figure out which country is going to do what piece. Um, and uh, so as much as it could be an engineering science decision, it's very much a political decision to figure out how you begin to break up a mission and begin to, to engage all the various organizations that need to be part of that. And at the end of the day, they're successful in figuring out how to put that together. Um, yeah, so. yeah, I mentioned the, the instrument I've been working on is a partnership with uh, Europe. There are 24 astronomical institutes in 10 European countries who are working on the other half of the instrument that I've been working on. And it works really well. Uh, so somehow they managed to put their differences aside and, and get it done. So it actually is kind of a nice picture of people working together. And yeah, it would be nice if the church did and that And that's too. encouraging <laughs> because our sample return mission in the next decade or so is uh, a collaboration with the uh, European Space Agency. And um, yeah, we hope that works. It doesn't always slow it down. I, I worked with JAXA on OCO3, and those people were on it. I think they were more on top of it than we were. Your Japanese colleagues, yeah. Oh, yeah, and in Japan. And uh, they kept us. They kept pushing us further, actually, along than I think we were used to, which was good. SpaceX, too, by the way. <laughs> How was the experience working with the Indians? <laughs> so, you know, it, it was really interesting. So um, it was a, a whole eye-opening experience for me. So the, the first time I went, um, you know, I was the chair of an organization and, and um, walked in, and, and the room was set up in a very formal way. And next to me was a director of something, I can't remember, um, who never actually came to the meeting, but he had a position at the table, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I remember after there was, they had a luminary there that had started the, their, their um, planetary program that walked out. He and I walked out together. Everybody else walked behind a few steps. And yeah. it, was, it was very much a, uh, uh, I, I could see that just, just the, the hierarchy and the, and the, the respect. And so um, one of the things I had to learn, which I met you, Matthew, was, was um, how to exist in that social structure and not, not yeah. offend. I wanted yeah. to understand their culture. Um, yeah. And I remember that they were running a, the program on a shoestring of what NASA spends. Um, and, and as a culture, it was, they were so excited yeah. to see what, the, what was going on and, and to be um, advancing in, in space technology and capability. Yeah. Well, the reason I ask this, this might be interesting for all of you, they, the, the head of ISRO, which is the NASA in India, uh, became the president of India. So that's how, uh, so that, that's a big deal. Yeah. Like your, uh, yeah. whoever your head is, yeah. uh, he becomes the president. And the president of India is an appointed position, not an elected position. So he was appointed by the, uh, the statesman. Um, so that's, that's why I, I was asking that question. I heard that they go barefoot in their clean rooms. That kind of bothered me. <laughs> well, you I know, I went in their clean room, but I just, but I just don't remember. But yes, <laughs> <laughs> I the, was opening, I could, the door would open when I was getting yeah. worn off. But. It might be also interesting for you to know that all these famous scientists in India, before they launch rocket or whatever, they do the actual Hindu puja in front of that mm. rock. It's a tradition. It's a cultural oh, tradition. Imagine know. you asking a pastor to come and pray before you launch Mars rover. Just imagine that. That's exactly, yeah. That. I'm available. Not a bad idea. But. <laughs> Matthew, you're up for it? <laughs> By the way, when I went to JPL, uh, uh, Lauren gave us, uh, I mean, they gave us a tour for all the pastors, and they didn't allow me to go to certain rooms because I'm a Canadian. 
And Mark literally babysat me because I couldn't go inside. Every All other pastors went except me. You can't trust those Canadians. I know. I mean, you're the only... So JPL he, he is the only place. He wasn't allowed to go to the center of the universe. That's right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, this is... <laughs> This is an in intriguing question. you can see it through the window. Yeah. That's right, I did. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is an intriguing question. Uh, I don't know what this means. What percentage of JPL is underground? Like a physical? So, so J JPL does do a bit of what we call dark work. Um, so, you know, there's, there's clearly some um, uh, transfer capability between uh, what we do in exploring space um, and uh, supporting um, more military and other kinds of applications for national defense. Um, I think JPL spends um, about 85% of its uh, funding comes from NASA, about 15% comes from non-NASA sources. So that it can include other agencies like National Science Foundation, uh, NOAA, and so forth, but, but also from the Department of Defense and, and others. So, um, so, there's the, so we do have uh, we call it dark work, and, and uh, we do have some people that uh, work on, on some of those kind of projects. And certainly JPL had some roots in that okay. uh, in the early days. Yeah, well, you, you, a lot of systems engineers, which is what I do, they do a rotation mm -hmm. at some point in their career in the DOD, in the dark, and it's one building, and we all kind of know where it is, and you're not allowed to talk about anything that you do at all the whole time you're there. So a lot of people do a rotation, and then they leave because they want to tell people about what they're doing. <laughs> and, and, and those people have been working every day, uh, 40, hour, 40, days, 40 hours a week uh, through the pandemic. Yes, they have. Wow. They're the only other people on lab besides um, they, they operations from Mars. Right. But if you actually meant under the ground. Um, <laughs> I, no, I was not sure. I thought that was the question. <laughs> yeah, beyond a few basements, most, most of JPL is actually above ground. Um, when, when I was an undergrad at MIT, there's actually more tunnels and basements at MIT than I can think of at JPL. Yeah, it's um, all. It's, in, in California. There, California. Yeah, there are a few basements, but not, basements. We have but a not many. But yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, all, that's it. Yeah, most, mostly what you see is what you get. <laughs> well, the next question might pit you against each other. Um, this is what it is. What do you is think? It about, is it about money? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, or in your opinion, JPL's greatest innovation or scientific achievement? OK, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say two things, Voyager because it's still going. Uh, and it's outside of our solar system. It's the only man-made object to ever leave our solar system, i.e. It, it, the sun doesn't control it anymore. It's beyond that. That's crazy. The PI, the, the person that is Mike, he's been the PI for 40 plus years. <laughs> Talk about long-term. And I'd say the other is the helicopter, because that's just cool. <laughs> Well, since she mentioned Voyager, um, the thing I can think about most is actually when I was still an undergraduate in January 1986, Voyager 2 passed by the planet Uranus. Um, and that, that was cool in itself, but um, what really grabbed me was my undergraduate thesis advisor was the person who discovered that Uranus has rings around it, um, and he discovered it by indirect measurements. And so the fact that we now had a spacecraft, well, it wasn't parked, it was flying past, but taking pictures of the rings from 50,000 miles away when we normally see it from 2 billion miles away um, just drove home what kind of crazy place JPL was. And that, that was while I was still an undergrad, not even working here. Hey, Voyager took some of the first images of the outer planets that we had yeah. ever seen. Well, it's still the only spacecraft to have gone to them. Yeah. So. It's, uh, I think there's so many. That's a little hard to, to, to narrow it down, but one of the things I, I, I think about is, um, is Galileo. Uh, and when we um, launched Galileo, its high gain antenna couldn't deploy. So that's how we do the communications. It has a, a low gain antenna for the lower data rate um, and uh, JPL quickly rewrote the software, uploaded new software to it, and was able to actually save the mission by being able to use a low gain antenna. Um, and you just, you hear uh, things like that um, 
where, where we actually even innovate in the middle of a mission because the unexpected happens. Right. And, so, and so that's... Dan, that, that data compression that we used, um, is that, did that become a, a, a it, it, common you know, thing? In a, in we, we said no data compression until we needed to use data compression. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's so, right. So on top of all that, it, the, the, uh, just the opportunity to inspire um, the public and kids, um, you know, JPL I think does a good job with that. Yeah. And uh, it's a tremendous uh, uh, output. Well, we have a lot more questions here, and uh, I think a, a number of them are already answered because it's the same question from different angles. And a, a lot of them are very technical, so if I read it out, a half of you will start sleeping and, you know, go above everybody's head. So this is what I'm going to do. I promise you this. Um, I don't know if I can get them together again anytime soon, but I can ask these questions. And this is going to be available as a YouTube video, like, you know, so you are going to watch whatever is being recorded now. Along with that, I can include, uh, what do you call the, the DVD, uh, make behind the scene or deleted scenes, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like that, I can, I can sit, uh, you know, in a, in a confined environment, ask them that technical questions, and I will make that video available for you through a, your YouTube channel, okay? So um, I'm going to end with, the, this is the last question for you, because I said 8.30 and it's already 8.50. Uh, and I also want all of you to come back for our next in the series, which is October 20th and it is on COVID, and it is about medical, we'll have a gather a group of medical professionals, and uh, that's, you know, just as relevant as this is, if not more, if for, from ordinary perspective. So, uh, this one is actually, apart from a question, this is a compliment to all of you, so I wanted to read that. Statement or observation. The four of you have successfully dispensed the myth that engineers and scientists are not gregarious, personable and fun-loving. Great job. <laughs> Great job. Uh, what do you, each of you do to unwind or decompress? Um, you want to start from here? Yeah, Mark. Yeah, so, so let me just say that, that I've noted um, for, for a while, maybe in the 90s and in early 2000s, there was a, a craze where we were doing a lot of personality tests. And... Um, I, I, I did all those tests, and it turns out that, that when I do it, thinking of what I do at work, I'm an extrovert. Um, but when I come to think about with, with, with church friends, I'm an introvert. And uh, I think it's just because everybody at JPL is an introvert, and I just sort of stand out. Uh, <laughs> just a little bit more uh, on the scale. Anyway, uh, what I do, I, I, I do a lot of mountain biking. Uh, I do a lot of exercise, uh, for, uh, ride around. Uh, Putting Stone Res Reservoir in Benelli Park. I've always been an extrovert. There's no kidding. <laughs> there's no doubt about it. Uh, I co I'm a CrossFit coach, so I actually not only compete in CrossFit, although right now I can't really compete that well, um, but I coach CrossFit. Uh, uh, so it's also just another way to to challenge people for the long haul. Uh, to stick with something and continue building up perseverance. Ah. Um, and also, it's pretty amazing how great kids are at making you unwind uh, because they're so goofy and silly. And my two, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and they're just the goofiest kids ever. So honestly, hanging out with them and reading them stories and going on scooter adventures is like a major unwind for me right now. Uh, let's see. Well, I, I actually am an introvert. I have figured out how to talk in public, <laughs> so that's why I'm here. Um, uh, let's see. I like to play trombone, uh, so I play in a bunch of different things. So come to the Caltech Orchestra concerts. Um, and I, the community orchestra here at church, I play with them too. So th those have been some ongoing musical activities. Uh, we got dogs and cats, and even though my kids, I have three boys, are all in their 20s now, um, they're still a blast. Um, so talking to them, catching up with them, even though they're geographically all over the place now, is, is still a lot of fun. So. 
Well, for me, in the last uh, year, we, we picked up biking more, and so that's really been a, a fun thing that we've been able to, to do. But um, we made a decision when our kids were little, uh, and uh, we tried to take them to hotels, and uh, that was it, it's never fun to have small kids in a, in, a, in, a, in a hotel room with you. And so we bought a fifth wheel trailer, and uh, we've done a lot of um, traveling, kind of uh, to the beach and the coast and to the deserts and all over uh, in our trailer. And it's been a, a good way for us to bond as a family. Now, um, I just wanted you to know that. Um, some of you asked if you could take pictures with them. <laughs> this is your <laughs> moments of uh, celebrity uh, fame. So they will be available if you want to take pictures, but uh, all your questions, and probably don't bother them with that questions again, because they may have to get back to their houses, uh, homes. Uh, so- uh, have work tomorrow, right? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, <laughs> but I will answer, get these questions answered, uh, but they will be here for a few minutes or so if you want to take pictures uh, and all that. Hey, once again, thank you so much for being part of the kitchen table. Just like the tagline of the kitchen table reads, we had, uh, we had small talk, right? This is a small talk, family talk, but we had big conversation. That's a great tagline uh, because I made it up. So, you know, I, I like it. I really like it. small talk, big conversation. Um, so um, come back again by 20th of October for the next one. Uh, as you go now from this man-made cathedral to the God-made cathedral, right? That's where you feel. God bless you all.